so to start with, uh, let me just introduce our dean, uh, uh, Meng Chen, and he's going to introduce our uh, distinguished lecturer. Thank you, Stanley. Uh, it is indeed overwhelming to see uh, so many nerds here at a nerdy talk uh, uh, with the title Machine Learning Dynamic, Economic, and Stochastic Perspectives. I would never have thought if the word stochastic is in the title of the lecture that we'll have uh, standing room only and also being streamed live and archived recording as well, uh, and people are still streaming in here, uh, must be because of the outstanding lecture that I'll int be introducing in just a minute. Uh, but this is one visualization that uh, Purdue uh, Engineering is the largest among top 10 uh, engineering schools in the United States. Uh, now, uh, as we get towards the end of the semester and this academic year, we are delighted to host uh, one more, uh, and there's uh, one more at the end of the month, of the Distinguished Lecture Series from Purdue Engineering. We started this about a year ago. And each year, we bring about eight uh, most outstanding uh, speakers and scholars from around the world in different disciplines. And the hope is to inspire all of us towards the pinnacle of excellence at scale. In the case of data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, they mean different things. But uh, let's say we bundle them somewhere close to each other for now. Uh, there's a lot that uh, we can be doing here at Purdue. I'm proud to say that in applications of data science, areas such as infrastructure monitoring to imaging, digital agriculture to advanced manufacturing, Purdue Engineering has tremendous talents and success in the application of data to these domains. In the foundation of data science, including machine learning, uh, we are growing with tremendous speed and momentum. For example, uh, glad to brag about uh, our work in uh, computation and visualization of data, including the hardware software system of Bring Inspired Computing, uh, led by uh, ECE faculty uh, Kaushik Roy and Anand Raghunathan, that won the SRC DARPA, a $40 million five-year uh, center uh, in the nation in uh, Bring Inspired Computing Seabrick. And today's distinguished lecturer is somebody who has reinvented the field from so many different perspectives, computational and stochastic and statistical, cognitive and biological. Uh, I met uh, uh, Michael Jordan, I think, uh, about a year ago at uh, the uh, 60th birthday party for my uh, former co-advisor, Stephen Boyd, and I listened to uh, Dr. Jordan's talk uh, contrasting the philosophical differences between the derivative view and the integration view in control versus optimization community, and it was fascinating. And I uh, took the courage to ask if Michael will be interested in visiting Purdue uh, next year. Uh, and thank you so much for taking the time. And I'll abbreviate uh, Michael's outstanding uh, biography to just a few sentences. Uh, Dr. Jordan is a member of both NAS and NAE, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has received numerous awards from diverse intellectual communities, from IEEE and ACM to SIAM and uh, IMS. Uh, notably, uh, just last year, during uh, the International Congress of Mathematics, uh, Dr. Jordan was a plenary speaker uh, at that event, which was, I think, 2018 was the last one. Uh, and we are all so excited that you are here today, Michael, to talk about uh, your perspectives in machine learning. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, it's a great crowd. It's great to be here at Purdue. Do you have a little one more announcement? Yes, please. Because these gentlemen, they, uh, gentlemen, can you uh, move to the overflow room? Because we're not allowed to have um, more people than this room can hold. Oh, cool. 
Yeah. Uh, although there are quite a few seats down here if some of so, them want to so quickly grab uh, them. We do have an overflow room. Uh, can you just walk with Maria? We were going to uh, bring you to the other room. Okay, we, we have live streaming, so don't worry about that. No, that's fine, that's fine. I'll give them a couple of seconds here to High class problem too. diffuse. In fact, let me take away my jacket so this is for somebody next to the dean. I don't bike in the afternoon, so. Uh. Yeah, you're very brave. All right. Um, so yeah, this talk is for the young people in the audience. Uh, I'm glad to see a lot of students. Um, this is for you. Uh, you know, what things should you be thinking about studying? Uh, what are the opportunities and so on? So I'm going to bounce back a bit between philosophical conceptual issues and, uh, but all the way try to what research problems come from these considerations. So. I also have a little bit of a blend of academics and industry. Uh, one thing I've liked about being in the Bay Area is uh, all the industry around us, and it's influenced me a lot. I'm also going to China a lot these days and seeing development of IT industry there, and it affects my thinking quite a bit, as you'll go to see. Um, okay, so um, let me talk about this field. Let's call it machine learning for now. If you were there this morning at a panel, you'll know that I kind of think of this as statistical decision-making under uncertainty. That's the real field that we're all talking about, but here's a buzzword. And of course, it is being called AI these days. And I, uh, if you were there this morning, you see I kind of resent that. I don't think that this what, that's what this is at this point in time, at least. We don't know what intelligence is. Um, but anyway, uh, it's not new, um, as most things. But it's not even new in terms of success stories. So just very briefly, I kind of have companies like Amazon.com here in mind. But you know, already in the 1990s, they were taking in vast amounts of data, um, and they were using it for uh, business uh, purposes, in particular fraud detection. If you're building an online commerce system, you can't have fraud rates like credit card 3% fraud rate. So they used machine learning to take in large amounts of data about fraud, not fraud, and made the distinction. They got really good at that. Uh, even more important perhaps is supply chain management. This sounds maybe dull, you know, it's a business school thing or whatever. It's not dull and, and, and it's broader than business school. It's, it's all about uh, yeah, I've got a billion products and then they've got to be assembled and brought to the right place at the right time to meet certain customer needs in different seasons and all that. And in the old days, if you had a thousand products and, you know, a million customers, that was sort of classical. You could build it by hand. And eventually, no, it had to be all done by data. So companies like that already in the 1990s were modeling the probability the ship would get stuck in the Indian Ocean so you wouldn't get certain parts and, and you know, and do that at a, across not just a billion products, but all the parts that go into those products. And so they continue to this day to have, you know, hundreds of people working on that and companies like Amazon, Alibaba, and so on. Having built those systems that support that and doing lots of other things like A-B testing was quite important in that, in that era. Uh, now they had the computers behind the scenes that could do all this data analysis. I, they started to think about other uh, services they could offer now for people, not the back end. Because uh, the data in the back end were about people, but why not just directly uh, influence people's uh, you know, give them new services. So recommendation systems, you've all seen that at places like Amazon. You go and interact a little bit, you buy some books, they start to recommend some other books. That was critically important for that industry to arise and for Amazon to become what it is today. All done with machine learning, all done with just the kind of gradient descent algorithms that we're talking about today. And, it's in, and in fact, the, the algorithms haven't really changed that much. Okay, so kind of what changed is now in this third generation, there's this focus on pattern recognition problems, more of the kind of human variety. You know, computer vision is like trying to imitate human vision or animal vision and speech and so on. And the old algorithms with the new data sets and computing are able to do really very well on those things. So people have gotten all excited, uh, I think probably too much so, given that there was a kind of a billion dollar industry implications of the ideas already. And people didn't talk about it too much, but you know, very much more important really than bullet three so far economically, just no comparison. But bullet three is kind of about human capabilities, and so people are getting both panicky and excited. Um, you know, but it's going to be decades before we get kind of anything resembling intelligence in computers, and probably not even more, probably more than that. Uh, so what it is, it's gradient descent-based data analysis at large scale, and so it kind of can find things and do pattern recognition, and that's all pretty interesting, almost becoming a commodity. Um, now, is that the end of it? Well, definitely not. So I think what's emerging is uh, what I'm going to talk about as a kind of the decision side of machine learning. So if you think about machine learning, at least two parts to it. One is do the recognition, find patterns and recognize them and so on. The other is make decisions. Definitely not the same thing. Even if you're thinking about one decision, like a, a, but a consequential one, not about where do you put an ad placement or something, or if there's a giraffe in the image, um, rather like a medical decision. So you go into your doctor's office and doctor takes all the data available at that moment in time, or maybe from all around the world, it's flowed in, 
And uh, they measure all kinds of things about your body, including your genome, your height, your weight, your blood pressure, but many, many other things. They put that into some big machine learning system and it outputs um, that you look like you're about ready to have a heart attack, you need to have a heart operation tomorrow. And, and uh, so is that a decision? No, that's just a number coming out of the network. It's like 0.7 is the threshold, it's 0.72, all right? Are you just gonna accept that as a decision? Well, no. Um, you're gonna wanna have a, a dialogue. You're going to say, well, um, where are your error bars, first of all? And current systems aren't producing much in the way of error bars. Secondly, you're gonna wanna have uh, some what if questions. What if I were to exercise more? Or what if we get a second opinion? Or what, and even more importantly, where did the data come from that led you to make that 0.7, okay? If you build a system that's just working right now on today's data, which what people do, they take the image data set and they use that data to train a network. Uh, and let it run for four or five years, it's gonna be out of date in all kinds of ways. This is called provenance in a uh, database field, um, but they're just kind of interested in accounting aspects of the data. If you're thinking about inferential, it matters when the data was collected for who on what machine to decide whether it's relevant to the current decision. Okay, that's one piece of a very much bigger sort of thing. That's just one decision. You want a whole dialogue about the decision, back and forth. Um, but now, it's rarely one isolated decision. It's almost always a decision in the context of other decision makers. There's often big batches of decisions, like a system like Uber right now in Chicago is making huge numbers of decisions about where to allocate things and so on. Uh, commerce systems are doing this and so on. So that's the really level we want intelligence. We don't want it at the individual agent level we're replacing a human being, which is really, really not gonna happen. We want it at the overall sets of decisions. Okay. Um, so let me, in fact, dig in this word. It's a little bit from the panel kind of discussion this morning, but people are now using this word intelligence for, for uh, you know, AI, for uh, this data analysis um, and decision-making problem. Um, so do we really have intelligent systems? Well, I'm gonna argue no, and I don't think we're gonna have them in, in a meaningful sense of intelligence. We have things that mimic intelligent behavior from data. That's different. All right, so suppose you're up on Mars and you're a Martian computer scientist and you're looking down at the world the Earth, you're trying, you have very primitive computers, you're trying to get inspiration for how to bring more intelligence into your computers. So you look down on Earth, what do you see on Earth that's intelligent, that worth kind of trying to mimic, right? Uh, well, most people certainly think of brains and minds. Um, maybe we can figure out how those brains are working down there. They seem to be doing something intelligent and, 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 and understand the mind. Um, I would argue we're not remotely close to the, that understanding. Even a single neuron, it's a cell, and it's got all kinds of proteins swimming around it and all kinds of structures, and then it does all this electrical stuff, and it's got this branching tree with you know, tens of thousands of ramifications, and et cetera, et cetera, I could go on forever. You know? Even a single synapse is extremely complicated. Um, so it's gonna take you know, more lifetimes than I have to give. It's gonna take hundreds of years, really, to start to understand not just a neuron, but we put now billions of them all together in this complicated way. You know, we're not there, we're not even close. We don't have the principles. Okay? And even in psychology, we don't understand really how you know, uh, abstraction abilities of humans really arise and the ability to talk, give a talk and talk and semantically communicate, all those things. It's really interactions of us with the world at all kinds of levels of abstraction in time and space. Extremely challenging. So the poor Martian computer scientist says, well, that's, I, can't do, I can't figure all that stuff out. What, is there something else down on Earth that I could look at and, and try to um, make, make more intelligent? Right? Um, and maybe you already get my setup a little bit. Most people don't, they scratch their head and think, well, maybe animals, you know? Nah, no, they're not so intelligent. Squirrel is a remarkable robot, but it's not super intelligent. All right, so uh, I would argue that we, you're, you know, that many people are just kind of missing what's obvious, that if you take an Econ 101 class, you're told you're to look at a city like Chicago, you know, every restaurant is, needs, has all the ingredients it needs for every dish it, it serves every day. Every household has the food. It's not perfect, but it works really amazingly well. It works 365 days a year for 3,000 years at all scales. Something is intelligent about that. It's, it's adaptive, it's robust, it's, it works at many scales, et cetera. All the kind of things people want out of machine learning, it has some of those properties. It doesn't have all of them, all right? So to me, and we know what some of the principles are, whereas in neuroscience and psychology, we don't know what they are yet. There, it's microeconomics. We have some ideas of those principles. It's not, we don't know everything, and we're gonna have to think about new kinds of markets. Now, what kind of markets? Well, markets that bring in data analysis. All right, so minimally think about something like a recommendation system. Suppose I have a two-way market, I got producers and consumers, and they're not just attached to each other in the usual traditional way. Rather, they see each other through a recommendation system. Already, that's an interesting question, and that's a billion-dollar question to do that well, okay? All right, so I'm gonna be digging into things like that during the talk. All right, a little more philosophy before I really get going. So, 
I wrote a blog this past year. If you haven't seen this, I, I would like to encourage you to read it. Um, I don't usually advertise my work, um, but this was on Medium, and uh, I think I've had about 400,000 views of it. By, in fact, a lot of kind of famous people. I usually get four or five views of my papers. Um, <laughs> too many uses of the word stochastic. Um, but anyway, this has been read by a lot of people, and I do want more people to read it, have this dialogue. So it tries to say, look, this buzzword AI, first of all, it's not one thing. We shouldn't be lumping everything together. It's a mistake to do that. There is the classical, let's imitate the human idea. There's nothing wrong with that. It's what McCarthy had in mind and others. Um, for better or for worse, it's what a lot of the people who are self-proclaimed AI people still have in mind, which is this aspiration of we have computers now, there's hardware and there's software. That looks like brain and mind. Uh, maybe in our generation, we're going to be able to put intelligence inside of a computer. Okay, so that was McCarthy in the 50s. Turing was thinking that way. I'd say in the intervening 50 years, we've made very little progress on that, frankly. And I've been in a neuroscience department. I did psychology and, I, and so on and so forth. I've been watching this for a long time. So it's great to continue to aspire to it, but it's just not what's happened. Right? What has happened is what's sometimes called intelligence augmentation, different people. Um, which means that the computer is in itself not smart, but it organizes information in a way that helps make us more smart. And certainly search engines do that, um, and all kinds of computing things in our life make, our, make us more intelligent, more creative too. And that will continue, all right? Uh, search engines are arguably not intelligent. I don't think anyone would argue that it is. But it, behind it, a lot of engineering and intelligence went into the design of it, and it makes us more intelligent, okay? Um, all right, but anyway, what I think is emerging is more interesting than just even that. It's this intelligent infrastructure. Some, some you know, maybe call it Internet of Things, if you will, but Internet of Things was more about just the more prosaic problem of getting IP addresses for all kinds of objects. All right, that, that's fine, but um, more interesting is what if all those objects have data streams associated with them, and those data streams are a little bit incoherent, and they have to be made coherent so that decisions can be made at scale. So that's kind of the bigger problem. And think about not doing that just for, like, factories and cars, but think about... Uh, internet things like in the medical domain, you know, all kinds of sensors are all around bodies and, and, and you know, so on in hospitals and all that data flows so that people get better and better treatment over time. The system supports that. That's what I have in mind. Um, okay, so one last little slide about this. So I don't think this human-imitative imitative, human imitative AI is really the right goal for a lot of these things because it really isn't about one making a smarter, a, a computer smart and replacing a human, right? It's making a system that works. So think about self-driving cars. Should it be an autonomous sit car? Should we go for autonomy? You know, if you read most, most people's writings about this, that's what they say, we want autonomy. No, you don't want autonomy. You want the cars to communicate among each other. If a boy just ran out in the street, a car sees that, it tells all the other cars around it. Um, every car tells every other car where it's trying to go and what it wants to do. It's more like the air traffic control system, right? And so you don't want autonomy. You want a federated system that trades off things and interacts, and you want the principles to build such a system, critically. And those principles do not emerge by looking at a single car and a driver and trying to replace the human uh, and just focusing on it as the core problem. Okay, we're going to actually solve the problem without putting in a, dri a, a fake driver so much. We're going to have all these sensors and all, and all that sort of thing. All right. It's kind of ridiculous if you think about it, that if you think about previous engineering disciplines, like I, I, in this blog, I talked about chemical engineering and civil engineering, which were super exciting in their day. And uh, it took a few decades to roll out, but people really did great things there. Um, and they developed other kinds of principles that didn't exist before. It's like from chemistry to chemical engineering, it's a big gap, right? Um, and those principles are what we should be thinking about um, right now. So, can you imagine a, chemical, a chemist saying, we need to create this field called chemical engineering where we know how to create factories. The way we're going to do that is we're going to create an artificial intelligence entity, an artificial chemist, who's as smart as a chemist who will figure out how to build a factory. Right? That's ridiculous. That's not what happened. That, that, that's implausible. But if you read like, the literature from, say, DeepMind or something, that's what they're saying. We're going to figure out how to solve cancer by creating an artificially intelligent agent who then looks at all this data and figures out how to solve cancer. Come on. All right, so anyway, if you had a little formula, people talk about AI. If you're going to use this term, which again, I'm going to push back on as long as I can, uh, it's data plus algorithms plus machines. You're saying that's all you need is the data, the algorithms, the machine. Well, no, you need it in the context of markets and trade offs and people and, and utilities and so on and so forth. Okay, um, and lastly, um, one last philosophical slide, which is that the IT companies that are doing a lot of this machine learning and building these services are really not thinking about a market at all. They're thinking about, we're going to build a search box or a social network, and it will be this service that you like and you use, 
All right, it's all in the virtual world. We're not trying to connect producers and consumers and make a market. We're just trying to provide this, this service and we, we know you won't pay for it because it's not that good. Um, so since you won't pay for it, we have to create an advertising market and we make our money off that, right? Rather, why don't you try to think about producers and consumer relationships and make that so strong that people are willing to pay for it and you take a cut. And this is not mystery as Uber does this, okay? So in the world of transportation, it's not perfect, it has all of its issues, but in the world of transportation, they've created, they don't advertise on the Uber platform, right? They don't need to. And this advertising model, it, you know, is really broken a lot of the, the rollout of IT. It, it's really put us in a bad place. So we need to think in a new way. And I think markets is a good starting place. Okay, so now what do you really work on when you work on this kind of set of problems? Well, here's some of the challenges in this, let's call it II. Uh, these are things I've been working on for the last 10 years. And you can sort of scan your eyes there. There's, there's some pattern recognition, but not really. I kind of view that as kind of pretty good shape, all the gradient descent there. But, you know, uh, real time, cloud edge, markets, multiple decisions, and so on. Um, so I've decided in the rest of the talk, I'm just going to pick two or three of these. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about conceptual issues, uh, especially for decision making and markets. And, and then the last part, I'll go a little bit through some of the actual mathematical algorithmic issues that arise and some, so how, how some of them can actually be solved. Uh, they need a little bit of new mathematics, um, but not always. Um, but I want to give that flavor as well. And if you're interested in the latter, uh, I, what I'm going to be doing is giving snapshots of a talk I'll be giving tomorrow, where I'm going to dig into the actual mathematics more. Um, okay, so let's talk about multiple decisions. Okay, so again, AI classical people don't think too much about multiple decisions. They think about network outputs a decision that you're done. Um, or maybe a sequence, that's called reinforcement learning. All right, but often you have lots of federated decisions, so let's think about that. Um, all right, so when decisions interact because there's a scarcity of resources, you know, that's what econ people talk about. And people in AI haven't been thinking about scarcity very much. So, in fact, here's, again, one of the big success stories is, e is recommendation systems. You know what they are. They take data from one customer and they cluster customers and, or cluster products and make recommendations between them. All right, so they've been used for all kinds of things, like movies was uh, an early one, books. Um, so suppose that I build a recommendation so it makes a recommendation of a certain movie. Um, now, is it okay to recommend the same movie to everyone? Um, so will this happen, first of all? Yes, that's how recommendations work. It's a big black box. They take in a lot of data. Um, when I come into a site like Amazon, they make a feature vector out of me, you know, like 40,000 dimensional feature vector, and they put it into this black box, and out pops a list of recommended books or movies. Um, later, um, you know, someone else comes in, Moon comes into the same site, um, they featureize him, and maybe it's a nearby feature vector, but whatever, it's a different feature vector, they put him into the same box and they'll recommend some books and movies. So they can easily recommend the same movie to me and to him, easily. And probably if it's Amazon, they recommend the same movie to 100,000 people a day. That, that happens, I'm sure, all the time. Is that a problem? Well, no, there's no scarcity here. Uh, what about books? If you recommend the same book to 100,000 people in all by, is that a problem? Well, no, it used to be there was scarcity, but now you can print on demand. You can get books like into the warehouse within a day, uh, so you don't even have scarcity there. Do you have, well, scarcity meaningful? Of course it is. In the real world, there's scarcity all the time. All right, so here, uh, this came from a little bit of travel in China. I watched people uh, building business models around recommendation systems, because recommendations had to become a commodity. You can download software to do a large scale, really distributed uh, recommendation system. So people are doing that for things other than books and movies. So here's one, how about restaurants? So that'd be nice. I'd like to, I arrive in Shanghai, um, I don't speak the language very well and I'm by myself. I'd like a recommendation system to know about me and to you know, give me a recommendation. And a high quality one, not just an advertisement. Right? Well, there are companies that tried to do that. Right? And so they download some recommendation software, they take some data wherever they can get it, and they put them in it. And maybe they do okay. They rec but it's not what I want. It's a list of things. It's maybe some reviews. It's complicated. I don't want all that complexity. All right? Moreover, uh, if it works, uh, if it starts to work for a you know, few people, that's fine. But as soon as like half of Shanghai is using it, you know, five million people, you could easily recommend the same restaurant to 10,000 people or more. And they all go there and there's a big line. You've created congestion. Okay, so it's not unfamiliar to an econ person. But a lot of these CS people realize this after the fact. It starts to get scaled and they start to have new problems they didn't think about. Well, come on, folks, you should have thought of that beforehand. In fact, it's not that hard to sort of so to solve this kind of thing. You create a two-way market. And what that means is that I, I'm in Shanghai, I pull up my cell phone, I'm ready, it's 6 p.m., I'm ready to eat, I'm hungry, I want to push a button on my phone, 
have the phone geolocate me and have my feature vector somehow formed, a recommendation system, and then have that transmitted to all of the, to app, to all the restaurants around me. And then their app, um, it says, here's a possible client for you. His price point is here. He likes Sichuan cuisine or whatever. Um, and then some of them will decide to bid on me. Uh, then a bidding mechanism will ensue. Um, on my phone, I'll get a bing, and I'll see a restaurant, and I'll see some dishes, and I'll see a price, and I'll see the distance, and I'll say, great, I accept. So it's like Uber. It's not that complicated. Once that transaction has happened, uh, that seat in the restaurant is taken. And if he comes in later, he's too late. Okay? Um, and if I don't accept, maybe then they'll offer me a better discount. It's a market, right? And so on. And then other restaurants around can see when one is full, and they can make, other, they can make discount offers. That's how it works. All right? Um, and it's not that hard to do data science in support of that. It's just not mostly being done. The IT people think they're going to understand everything about humans, just like advertisers do, and then give them what they want. Right? It's silly. Here's, even, uh, here's another one. What if you build a recommendation system to recommend people routes to the airport or wherever? Right? If a very few people are using it, no problem. As soon as half the city is using it, you send everybody down the same street. All right. It's obvious. People know this. But then how do you fix that? And the mindset in Silicon Valley is, well, we fix that by doing a super fancy AI, you know, they, this is Zuckerberg. He uses the word AI when he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Our AI systems will figure it out. And what does that mean? Well, they'll understand enough about humans to know what they really want. Okay, it's, yeah, I hope you see how silly that is, right? So how do you do this in the, real, in the right way? All right, well, if he and I are being sent down the same street, or, you know, 10,000 of us are being sent down the same street, well, the system shouldn't have to figure out who gets the street. We should have a bidding mechanism. So if I can reveal that I'm not so in a hurry today to get to the airport, I'll take a back street that'll take five more minutes and I'll pay less. And I'll save the money for a future trip. I'm going to be happy. And he's in a big rush. He gets to have the street for a little more money. He's happy. All right? That's, that's, that's the right way to do it. Uh, and so how do you do this? Well, just literally every piece of street bids on the people to pass over the street. And maybe new market mechanisms are needed, but you know, that's kind of the way to think about the problem. And then here's my favorite example. Again, this comes part from being in China, so you know, people now have, little, they have a little bit of money. So a grandmother's got 1,000 uh, you know, or 100,000 RMB, she wants to invest it. She doesn't know what that means. Uh, her son says, hey, I can download an app on your cell phone, it'll invest it for you. And she says, great. So uh, then the app will recommend to buy you know, Alibaba stock. And that's fine if it's like a few people, but what if half of China is using it? Well, then Alibaba stock shoots up artificially, and we've destabilized the market. Okay, so I hope you get the, the feeling that, it's, that you know, data science is needed here. These are data-oriented systems. It's not just classical markets where I connect producer-consumer. I have a classical link. It's all about data analysis. But the two together, so if you're technically, it's microeconomics meets statistics in a computing framework. Those three fields together, there's some power that has not even been started to be talked about, really, or realized as an academic and as a business person. Here's another example. Um, more people are making music than ever before. Uh, because laptops, you can make, you know, my 12-year-old makes pretty good, amazing little songs on his laptop. You can drive a taxi during the week and put up music on the weekend, and people will actually listen to it. But you're making no money because there's no market for you. And that's bad when there's not a market for human creativity. OK? Um, so how do you fix this? Well, um, you don't just stream that stuff to people, and then, because they're not willing to pay for it, uh, create an advertising mechanism to monetize. That's Spotify and so on, or a subscription. No, you create a market. And it's here, it's not all that hard. To everybody who's putting music up on SoundCloud, you give them a dashboard of the, the data's been flowing, you let them see the data. So I learned that I was popular in, um, in Peoria. Um, last week, you know, 5,000 people listened to me. Um, now that I know that, I can show that data to the venue owners in Peoria, and they will say, well, I see, if you come here and we advertise to those people, it's not even advertisement, it's information flow, that you're coming, they're going to be excited, they're going to come, we'll fill the venue, you make $10,000, um, and then if you do that three times during the year, you start to have a salary, right? And that can happen not just for a few superstar singer types that the record companies decide to anoint, that can happen for like a million people in a country. Okay, so mechanisms like that, as simple as they are, they use data together with markets, create jobs. All right, and you could do this now, not just for entertainment, but for information services. That's really what YouTube should be. It's more of an information service than just an entertainment thing that someone put up some entertainment. Okay, 
Okay, that was the economic side of multiple decisions. Let's now go back to the statistical side. So if you're a statistician, this kind of cartoon will be familiar to you. How do you make decisions in the real world? Well, per partly you have context, and that's where markets come in. The other part is you have uncertainty, and you better be really clear about that uncertainty. Okay, so here's a typical decision. Jelly beans cause acne. Someone has this as a hypothesis, okay? Some great new idea I've got. Um, and so it sounds ridiculous. It probably is, like most great new hypotheses are. So the scientists say, well, I'm going to investigate, and what's that mean? It, it ideally means doing an experiment. So I take 100 people, put 50 in the jelly beans category, 50 no jelly beans, and for six months, these people eat jelly beans every day, these people eat none, and after six months, I look at their skin condition. And probably there, there'll be some differences, but um, if you're a good statistician, you know something like a permutation test or something, you know how to get p-value that says, well, uh, if there's really no difference, the probability I'd see the observed difference is, you know, is high. So I'd say, okay, I get it, it's not real. I'm not gonna make a discovery in that situation. All right, so that's the classical setup that we've all learned. Um, all right, but that's never the real world. In the real world, people say, oh, I see, my, my dumb idea wasn't so good. I don't give up, I try some other dumb idea. And I try, keep trying a whole bunch of them. So if you've ever worked in a hedge fund industry or been in, around friends and that, that's all they do all day long. They think of clever little ideas. Um, if the price of this goes up, this is a, and then they try it on historical data and see if it works. It usually doesn't, and they're smart enough about the uncertainty to know that, and they don't bet on it. And eventually they find one that works, and they bet on it. Okay? And, but a lot of fields do this. All right, so they said, the, the person comes back and says, oh, I see, it's not, it's not jelly beans, it's green jelly beans, or it's red jelly beans, All right? And they keep trying. And I, I think you know what'll happen, but just be really clear about it. So every one of these, the scientists come in and they get a new one, fresh batch of 100 people. So we're gonna have a kind of overlap problem. All right, but you know what'll happen. Well, finally, at some point, they'll get 100 people. By chance alone, they'll take the 50 people who already have a bad skin condition, they'll put them in the jelly beans category, and the other 50 will go here. After six months, these people have bad skin condition. Okay? But you don't know that that's the reason, and you say, well, I discovered. I made a discovery. Now, the problem is that everyone will get all excited in the laboratory. We've made a discovery. Send it to the journal. The journal's excited because it's an interesting result. They publish it. And then even worse, the newspapers, whose job it is to scan the journals and find the interesting results of the year, say, that's interesting. It's interesting because it's probably false. Okay, so this is not new to me, obviously, or to statisticians, but statisticians work on this. All right? And um, not that many people outside statistics think too much in that way. And it, it really is a multiple decision-making problem. And so just to give you a little structure, I'm going to tell you a little about false discovery rate and tell you about an economic perspective on it, false discovery rate. So here's kind of the setup is that Say I'm doing nine uh, high tests of hypotheses, or I got you know, nine ideas. And suppose that in five of the cases on the left, the gray ones, um, there's nothing to discover. A typical situation, there's just nothing there. If I see a difference, it's by chance alone. Whereas in four cases, there's actually some discoveries to make. So I run some procedure, I do some neural net or whatever, and say in the four cases at the bottom, it makes a discovery. Uh, P9, P8, P2, P3. Um, but actually, God knows this, that uh, only two of them, P2 and 3, are real. The other two are false. So the fraction of false discoveries is two out of four. And so half of my discoveries are false. That's not too good. All right? False discovery rate is just the expectation of that proportion. Okay? So now, are there procedures to control false discovery rate? It's definitely not just the classical threshold and output of a neural net or something. Right? And to really drive home this difference, Let's look at something a little quantitative. Let's suppose we're in some industry, we're doing 10,000 different A-B tests today. Uh, and this is really the right, so Amazon has a website, and you've been there, it's kind of amazing looking. That's not some designer that did that, that's A-B testing. They said, let's try green instead of blue, let's try this instead of this, and they just try it every day on half the people get this, half the people get that, roughly. And they do maybe 10,000 a day, all right? Um, so let's suppose that we're in a situation that the industry is a little bit mature, that 9,900 of those tests they tried, there's really nothing to discover. It's not better to put blue instead of green. It's, it's, just, it's not true. Uh, mature scientists, scientists like that. Most of the things you think of are, are, you know, are actually not real. But 100 of them are real discoveries you could make and make some real money off of it. Okay? Now you apply your, your, your fancy machine learning techni techniques and you have a really good machine learning system. It's probability of making error of a type one, uh, meaning that when there's nothing to discover, you said it's a discovery, is smaller than 0.05. So of the 9,900, only 495 of them do you say discovery when you shouldn't be. Similarly, your neural net has got a very good power, meaning when there is a discovery made, you say there's a discovery. And the power is 0.8, so again, pretty good. So your engineers have designed a great system. 
but now just multiply out. 0.05 times, now there's 495 false discoveries. Out of the 100 non-nulls, you made 80 discoveries. If you add them up, your false discovery portion is 495 out of 575. Right? Meaning, you go back to the boss at the end of the day. He said, okay, I gave you a lot of money to do all these tests. How many discoveries did you make today? He said, well, I made 575. Here they are. The boss then says, uh, how many of them are false? You know, he said, eh, 495. All right, um, that's bad. You're going to now spend a lot more money following them up, trying them out, you're going to find out they don't really work. Okay, so there are there mechanisms to control this at the level, that, that proportion at the level 0.05? Or is it just you have to live with this? No, there are mechanisms. Um, there was something due to Benjamini Hochberg was the first one, but it's very batch-oriented. You take a huge batch of decisions and wait for a few days and then do it all in one lump. All right, so uh, we've been working on an online version of this, more of an economic version of this, where instead of making test after test after test at some fixed level, where that level kind of has to be really, really small as you make more and more tests, that's kind of the causal perspective, we let that level change over time. And here's the key, that false discovery portion is a ratio. So uh, you can make a ratio small in two ways. The numerator can be small or the denominator can be big. So if you're someone who's making a lot of discoveries, you're going to get some, I'm going to give you more and more wealth, okay, because that ratio will be under control for you. All right, and if you're not making many discoveries, your alpha will go down, and you'll start to see that. I'm not making any discoveries. I'm in the wrong field. So what does a human do at that point? Do they just continue to do, do the stupid thing over and over again, and then eventually they can't make any more tests because they exhaust so well? No, they move to a different field where there's new discoveries to be made. And those, that's good. That's what the statistics should tell us. So anyway, we've worked on this. Tiana Zernich in the middle has kind of been leading this in the, in the last round. Uh, she has a very nice paper on doing this in distributed asynchronous setting with dependence, kind of just a really, really real world thing that is industry ready, uh, her, her latest paper. So we have a way of setting these time varying alphas. Let me just show you a picture. It's very economic. In the beginning of your life, I give you a budget of certain number of alpha points. And every time you do a test and you don't make a discovery, you lose some alpha points. And if that keeps happening, eventually you dry up and you can't, make any, you can't do any more science. But if you ever make a discovery, they go down, down, down. You made a discovery, suddenly I give you some more wealth. And there's a formula for doing this. All right? And the formula correctly tells you and the following pretty strong result, which is that you can stop me at any time during my lifetime, say, how many discoveries have you made up until now? And I'll say, you know, 45. How, what fraction of them are false? Well, less than 0.05. And you can do that any time in my lifetime. Or you can even do that over a group of people. Okay? So this kind of way of thinking exists, and it should be everywhere, and it sort of needs to be. So if you think the decision part of the machine learning, this is a big part of the story. Okay, so. All right, so um, let me return to that slide. So these were, I talked a little bit here about multiple decisions, and I talked a little bit about markets. I won't talk about any of these other things really, but when the last uh, part of my talk, I'm going to spend a little time getting down into actual algorithmic and mathematical challenges that arise when one starts to work on these classes of problems. So uh, now we're a little more technical um, with no apologies. This is where the kind of, uh, if you're a student, you need to be learning about these kind of topics. So well, most of the problems we work on are non-convex optimization problems or they're sampling problems. In non-convex optimization, there's all things about dimension, about saddle points, about dynamics, and so on. And we've got to be quantitative about all these things. It's not enough just to be metaphorical. Uh, and in the, in the sampling world, we also have non-convexity, and we have dynamics that's complicated, and we want to link this to optimization, so we have an overall toolbox. And then we've got to bring market perspectives here, too, where we're often interested not in avoiding saddle points when we're optimizing, but going to saddle points, because those are equilibria, where there's a trade-off being realized. All right, so again, I have a whole bunch of work on all this. Tomorrow I'm going to go through some of this material more slowly, uh, but let me give you a few highlights. Um, and someone will tell me when I'm starting to run out of time here, okay? Um, so this was an uh, early paper for us that really helped set the tone of, this, uh, of a bunch of our projects after that. Uh, Chi Jen, who was on the job market this year, has led several of this, and she has become a world leader in non-convex optimization via this line of work. Uh, in particular, escaping saddle points efficiently is really, really important. Um, so here's a saddle point in three dimensions. Um, we're going to focus on how do you, uh, you're coming down, rolling down the hill, and a saddle point is kind of bad uh, th because it slows you down. And it may slow you down for a large amount of time. Now, in three dimensions, it doesn't look too bad. But if you're in 100,000 dimensions, there might be only one or two directions out, and it may take you a long, long time to find those directions and eventually escape. So we need to quantify that. How long? Is it exponential in dimension? Is it polynomial? What, what is the rate of escape from saddle points? 
And if you see real practical learning systems, in fact, like neural nets, what you'll see is the error goes down really, really fast and then it plateaus out. And it stays there for a good while and then it dives again and then it plateaus out. It keeps doing this. And those are saddle points. Um, and if you wait for not long enough, you think you're done. All right? And in an online system trying to make decisions, you might you know, just have to make your decision, but you should know that, no, you're not done. And we should have a theory that supports that kind of inference. Okay, so we're going to get a little bit of a math here, um, but I'm going to just highlight a few things. Um, so first, this, this is a result here on the left. Let me just focus on this line right here. So this is a classical result due to Yuri Nesterov. This is for the convex case, so we have a bowl shape. And I'm going to run gradient descent, which just takes the steepest descent direction. Okay? And I want to get to a ball of size epsilon around the optimum. There's a single optimum in that world, and I want to be at a ball of size epsilon. Question is, how many steps does it take to get in a ball of size epsilon all right, for a convex problem? And uh, so that's kind of all, has a little bit of a complexity theoretic side to it. And so it's not an old result, 1998. And the number of steps is given by right here. It's one over epsilon squared. Okay, so if I want a little small ball, it takes me more steps. And it goes as a quadratic. All right, moreover, there's a Lipschitz constant here, a two, and the initial distance to the optimum. We're trying to optimize a function f. All right, that's a beautiful result. This is not asymptotic. It's true for any epsilon. Um, uh, there's no hidden constants, there's, and all the constants are nice, natural ones. Okay? So this is the kind of res result you aspire to in this field. And over time, this kind of result has been achieved for lots and lots of areas of optimization. And there are lower bounds, and these tend to match the lower bounds. Okay. So we said, well, now if you run gradient ascent on a surface that has got saddle points, uh, what are you going to arrive at? Okay? So we had a paper that's showing that asymptotically you will not arrive at the saddle points. So that was known for continuous flow, but not for discrete, so we proved that. Then we proved that, um, that gradient descent alone can take exponential time in dimension to get away from all the saddle points. So that's bad, all right? Um, then there's another paper that shows that um, if you add some noise, stochastic versions of gradient descent, you can escape all saddle points in polynomial time. So that's a very important result, but it's just polynomial. It could be d to the 45th power or d to the third or something, not so good. All right, so we studied this for a while, and we came up with a result. Here it is, right at the top, which is the number of iterations in a non-convex landscape, okay, to go back past all the saddle points and arrive at a local minimum, is again one over epsilon squared. So it's as if you're on a convex problem with stochastic gradient descent. Okay, pretty amazing. There's a Lipschitz constant. There's initial distance to optimum. So again, it's one of these pure beautiful results, except for that little tilde there. And little tilde is traditionally used to hide dimension dependence because no one was able to analyze it. But here we did do the analysis of dimension dependence. That's the whole point of the paper. And it turned out to be not polynomial, not exponential, but actually logarithmic. Our particular proof techniques based on coupling arguments from probability uh, using Brownian motions. And that's responsible for the fourth power to be in there. I don't think it's really a four. It's probably just log. Um, but um, that's what we were able to get. Okay, so um, all right, so that's an early result using probability ideas, using some convex, non-convex geometry, and using this simple form of dynamics to show that you can actually have very, very favorable results. So people talk a lot about why do these large-scale machine learning things work? Well, stochastic gradient, everyone kind of agrees, is a reasonable thing, and this is actually supports that folk wisdom. This is a theoretical result that shows why it works. All right, the next critical step, and I'd say this is even more critical, so 15 minutes, thank you, uh, even more critical, which is to start to understand these things more deeply, you wanted to know, um, well, that result we just showed, let me just go back there. Actually, I should be using this. That's, you know, pretty, are we done? That looks like it, it parallels this case. It looks pretty beautiful. Is that the best you can possibly do? All right, and that's a really important question to ask. This is now real complexity theory, which meaning in some machine, in some setup, is there a lower bound? Is there the, is the best you can do? So you know the field is finished when you arrive at that lower bound, okay? And so, Mature fields tend to have lots of good lower bounds, and statistics has quite a few, like Kramer-Rao lower bound you may have heard of. Um, information theory has quite a few. I should say I don't think computer science has very many. Okay? They have a few, but they're very low. There's a big gap between them and the actual upper bounds that are known. Uh, it's, it's a hard field, but it's also a little newer. Um, okay, well, optimization theory has some very good lower bounds too, and it's partly because it's an older, older field. And a lot of them came from the Russian school of Nemirovsky and Estrov et al. Okay, so, um, uh, so here we're going to work on lower bounds. And so um, I forget what I have on the next slide. Let me just see. Yeah, I don't have it. 
So let me just say something in English. Uh, in the world of gradient-based methods, so I'm, suppose I build a machine who can, take a who can get a gradient oracle, I have access to gradients and nothing else, okay? Function values and gradients, all right? What's the optimal rate of convergence for that machine? Okay, that's a complexity theoretic question. And, and Nemirovsky answered that and showed that it goes from 1 over epsilon squared to 1 over epsilon, so much faster, okay? Um, uh, so, uh, actually, that's not quite right. He goes all the way to 1 over square root of epsilon, so even faster. Um, and so there's an algorithm that achieves that, and that was discovered afterwards by uh, Nesterov. And it's an algorithm that takes not just one gradient, but it takes two gradients and does a kind of very clever combination of them. And this was a big surprise to people that this was even possible. And that algorithm goes at this faster rate and it achieves the lower bound, so it's kind of the best algorithm. So, all right. Um, so we worked on this problem, and we said, well, that algorithm is still very hard to understand, and what, it's called an accelerator. What does it mean to accelerate in the optimization world? In the optimization world, you're hopping along a set of points. What does it mean to go faster along that set of points? Okay, it doesn't really clearly, and, and so this is part of the problem. People don't really know to develop a good general theory of acceleration because I don't think they have the right topology to support it. You need a continuum where you can go faster. All right, so you need to embed the problem in continuous time. And we did that and found that that gave a huge amount of insight. Um, in continuous time, you can turn up a knob and you can accelerate, accelerate, accelerate until someplace something breaks. There's a phase transition in continued time, which doesn't exist in discrete time. All right, so I, a, another kind of meta message here is that both optimization and computer science have almost always focused on discrete time algorithms, discrete everything. And you're missing some insights by doing that. You've got to go to continuous time. Okay, so we did, and it turns out that the acceleration algorithms due to Nesterov and so on, and a whole bunch of others, all came from a single object we called a Bregman-Lagrangian, and this in tomorrow's talk I'll dig into a fair amount. But there's a mathematical continuous time object, it's a function of position and velocity, and it has something called a Bregman divergence in it, and a few kind of parameters around, if you do standard calculus variations, you get out a certain differential equation, and if you specialize these alphas and betas and gammas to particular choices, you get specific uh, dynamical systems that are the one, Nesterovs and, and a mirror descent one and a cubic regularized Newton and all these continuous time algorithms that have been studied over the years, all, all fall out of this ex one, one master equation. Now, moreover, this master equation shows you that um, um, uh, no matter what rate you choose, you can do it in continuous time, but uh, you will always follow the same path in the phase space. So it actually has nothing to do with speed at all. It has to do with the path you follow. It's a geometric, acceleration has to do with geometry and not with just speed, all right? Um, moreover, if you ask to go too fast in a continuous time, that's okay. You can go as fast as you want, but that just means you're just sort of changing your clock. It's not really that important, all right? But if you're trying to go too fast in continuous time, there'll be a breaking point at which you can no longer discretize this differential equation. It's impossible mathematically. And that breaking point is where you've made a discovery that there's an algorithmic transition back in discrete time that there's a, you cannot do something at a certain place. Okay, so that, that's for tomorrow. Um, at the end of all this work, we were able to develop some new algorithms uh, because now we have this Lagrangian, we turn that into a Hamiltonian, we use something called a symplectic integrator, which is a smart way to integrate differential equations that are very stable. And now we just put all that into the computer and it's able to optimize using a symplectic integrator. So he was talking a little bit about derivatives versus integration. Here's using integration in the optimization setting. Uh, and it's just as good as Nesterov. But actually, it's even better than Nesterov, because if you turn up the step size, if you see we moved over to the left, we're going faster, uh, Nesterov flies off unstable, whereas this new integrator stays stable. Okay, so it's a really good way to get downhill. Okay, um, so um, again, for tomorrow's talk, I'll talk a little bit more about the consequences of all this. Uh, now we have a little bit of, if we go into continuous time, we get some insights. We also know a little bit of how to deal with non-convex geometry, saddle points. Uh, what if we put the two together, for example? So what if you're flying down a hill, but it's not convex, there's some saddle points down there. Is it good to be having an acceleration? And there's been two different intuitions, and no one's, and this has been an open problem. Some people say, well, as I'm flying down the hill and I hit a saddle point, I'll just go roll back up the other side, and that'll slow me down. Um, others say, no, the acceleration allows you somehow to blow past the saddle point. It's, it's, it's been intuition. Um, so anyway, we worked on that with these two tools. We used our, um, continuous time Hamiltonian or symplectic framework, and we used this um, you know, non-convex uh, non geometry coupling probability idea. And again, this is Chi Jen who led this. 
And at the end of the day, we were able to get, again, very strong results. There is our result at the very top. I, I don't want to get into details. But the rate went from 1 over epsilon squared to 1 over epsilon to the 7 fourths. That's a better rate. That's faster. Okay, so this is a proof that acceleration helps you in the non-convex setting. You, go f you fly past the saddle points more quickly with acceleration. So um, these tools allow us to get at results like that. Okay, next kind of step we've been doing is to put this in the domain of stochastics now. And so here's a question. Um, if we don't do just do this gradient descent, but we do stochastic gradient descent, or we do a diffusion, i.e. a Brownian motion kind of driven dynamical system, we're trying to, and we're trying to get downhill quickly, is there an optimal way to diffuse? Okay, so if you ever learned about diffusions or Brownian motion, it was probably in physics or in finance. And it's really, in both cases, just uses a model of some phenomena, of how things move, all right? But as an engineer, we're often interested in, I want it to move in a certain way. I want it to go fast down the hill, all right? And so people in statistics know this from like Markov chain Monte Carlo. You design an algorithm which should diffuse and get to an answer, and they'd love it if it went fast, but they don't really have the mathematical tools to do that. They sort of talk about mixing times, but they can never really get their hands on that. So it's kind of been an unsatisfying thing. Optimization theory tells you how to get down fast, and we even found that there's optimal ways to optimize. That's what this Bregman-Lagrangian is telling you. There's an optimal way to optimize. Is there an optimal way to diffuse? So that's a brand new class of problems, okay? Just, I'm going to give you a couple of results, but for uh, s s some of the young students in the audience, this is brand, this will be decades of work. This is going to be really interesting and challenging, and, and you know, if a young Kolmogorov were around, you know, he would probably, he or she, would probably start working on this because it's really, uh, very, very pregnant with possibility. Um, so anyway, um, what you do here is you study things like Langevin, Mon Markov chain, Monte Carlo. It, it's just a gradient descent. That's what it, I'm not using F anymore, I'm using U. But I have a gradient and I add some Brownian motion to give me the stochasticity. So this is a kind of a classical thing to study. Um, it turns out it has a rate, and uh, that rate has been analyzed um, uh, here. Here is a good example of the rate in green. So it's 1 over epsilon squared, which is kind of surprisingly fast, given I have all this stochasticity. And, but it has a d, it's not logarithmic in dimension, it's just d. That's kind of bad. And that's just kind of the stochasticity in all these dimensions. And that's a recent result. This is a very important paper by Durmus and Moulin. Um, but they studied this uh, stochastic differential equation there. Uh, it's just gradient descent plus noise, right? The, the work I've been talking about has these two gradients, and it has kind of two equations to it. It's oscillatory. It's more momentum. What if we put momentum into the stochastic framework? Will that help? And again, this has kind of been open. People had, haven't really known how to do that, um, or at least how to analyze it. Well, here's how you do it. You just write down two equations, not just one, and you put the gradient, the Brownian motion, and the velocity term, and then you integrate the velocity to get the position. So it's more of a second-order dynamics. All right. All right, so now can you analyze this stochastic differential equation? And that's kind of, again, the fun mathematics here is, yes, you can. You use some of the same coupling tools we were talking about. It's a reflection coupling instead of a classical coupling. Uh, and you use Ito calculus to do this instead of just regular calculus. But it's not, nothing particularly all that hard. Uh, and after we did all that analysis, we got a rate, which was not just 1 over epsilon squared. It was actually 1 over epsilon, so much faster for this thing. And we got, went from d to square root of d, which is even more impressive. So this algorithm is way better than classical Langevin, which is better than the classical MCMC algorithms, like Gibbs sampling and all. Okay, so we're really starting to get closer to better algorithms for MCMC. Um, and uh, they are non-reversible, and they are based on second-order accelerated dynamics, and the inspiration came from optimization theory. Okay. I'm going to skip this. I've got five minutes left. Um, just, again, if you come tomorrow, you'll see more about a comparison of optimization and sampling, and uh, also uh, a uh, relationship between this, the, uh, the notion of how fast can you sample. Uh, let me tell you about one more little thing, which is uh, go back to this market design issue. So I hope I convinced you earlier that thinking about markets is a nice way to think about lots of emerging IT problems. But again, what is the algorithmic mathematical challenge? Well, uh, market design is a field of its own, mechanism design, market design. Um, uh, you have to, to solve, to, to form a market, you have to do some kind of algorithm that moves you in some parameter space. And usually you're finding equilibria, um, like a Nash equilibrium. It's where, you know, he goes down and I go up, and so both of us are as happy as we can be. Um, so we know we've become experts on gradient algorithms in high dimensions. What if you run gradient algorithms, not to find the bottom of hills, but to find saddle points? And this is a classical field of study. 
the classical algorithms do one step of go down and then one step of try to go up. And so they try to find a song. And that's probably doesn't work. It, it can oscillate. It just is, it's a known failure. All right. So we've been working on this. Uh, one problem we've worked on is how do you find title points in high dimensions? And we want to find these Nash equilibria. And this is actually different than saddle points. So a Nash equilibrium is a saddle point, but it's axis parallel. His axis is one axis. My axis is the other axis. I want to be going down. He wants to be going up. If I take that same saddle point and tilt it and put it out there somewhere, it's still a saddle point, but it's not a Nash equilibrium. Okay? He's going to make progress on his axis. I can make progress. We'll move off. We would like to move off of that. But our gradient-based algorithms don't know, how, don't know the difference. All right? And so classical algorithms for this in the econ aren't gradient-based. They're way more complicated. They don't scale. All right, so long story short, with Eric, I, I should have introduced the students here. Uh, Eric uh, is, has been working on this with me. And then my two other students, Lydia and Hori, have been working on the other problem I want to briefly mention, which is competitive bandits and two-way markets. So bandits are a beautiful way to think about decision making in statistics and machine learning. Uh, I've got k options. I don't know which one of the options is the best, so I try all of them a little bit. And I start to figure out which one looks the best, and I start to pull that option more often, pick that more often. Right? But I also have uncertainty, and so I have to make sure I cover the things I'm uncertain about. And so there's algorithms like UCB that do this pretty well. But it's not been done in the economic context of other decision makers, usually. Okay? So what if um, both me and Moon are doing this? We are uh, both trying to find the best option for us. And, and, and the other side, it's the other side of a two-way market. There are merchants over there, and they may have preferences among us. So we don't know those preferences. So we start pulling these arms, and I start to see that I'm liking arm one, but I realize he's liking one arm, and I'm, like the, I'm starting to realize the merchant over there prefers him to me. So I start to hedge my bets and look at the other arms. So there should be a regret bound that reflects that extra exploration needed in a competitive situation. So that's with Lydia and Horia. We don't have a paper yet on that. Uh, that's very active right this moment. Uh, and, but we do have a paper with Eric. And let me just show you Eric's result. Um, this picture is not, this is my last one, I'll finish. Uh, it's, it's, uh, let me parse it just really quickly. There are three green crosses there. In this particular problem, those are Nash equilibrium. You see they're saddles, and they're actually Nash equilibrium. You'd like an algorithm to go find those. There's a blue one there, which is a saddle point, but it's not a Nash equilibrium. It's tilted. All right, we ran kind of a bunch of different algorithms uh, that are gradient based on this, and an example was the black one. If, if it starts, uh, of those red points, it'll go down and find the Nash equilibrium, but it'll also go to that blue point. It doesn't know the difference. All right. Our new algorithm, which is kind of gradient plus a little bit more, is the red curves there. It goes towards the bad e equilibrium, but then it moves away and moves to a Nash equilibrium. All right. so, um, so first of all, it's interesting to analyze this. We're still not done with that. Um, in particular, what is the convergence rate of this algorithm? Because you're paying an extra cost that you went towards something bad. You had to sense that it was bad and move away. So it took you longer. But you have to measure that somehow. Okay. Okay. So that's all I want to say. Let me just have a few concluding remarks. That was kind of a whirlwind tour through a bunch of different ideas. Again, this slide I already had earlier. Just sort of say it more slow. The computers are currently gathering huge amounts of data for and about humans to be fed into learning algorithms. And uh, often the goal has been to use all this to imitate humans, to try to make computers smart like us. And again, I don't think against that goal. I just don't think it's really what's happening, and I don't think it's the most interesting thing to be doing either. Okay? Um, it, it leads you down to the role of the whole point of the computer is to learn about people and provide services to them to understand them. And it's, it's a little bit just implausible that you're going to do that even with five people, but think about 500 million. Are you really going to understand 500 million people from their browsing patterns? No. All right. So we want to provide this in the context of mar market, and so when data flows, it's not just to be used for learning algorithms, it's used to create value. Markets. Um, and if you're an IT person or if you're an entrepreneur, which I hope some of you are in the audience, I hope you resonate to my message, which is now, you, if you think of it this way, you don't have to make money off of advertising, which is where Google and Facebook have all gotten stuck. That's why they're having so much trouble at doing the right thing. That, um, and so if you say, no, my role is to create connections between producer and consumer, how can I do that? You've created a market, that probably is going to be a more healthy thing for humanity, just overall. Okay, so this slide I've been using for about 10 years, but let me just have it up there at the end. Uh, this field is coming of age, but it's really not, it's going to be quite a while until we have really what I would call an engineering discipline. We have just people building things out there, um, sometimes trying to do the, the right thing and build good services for people, sometimes just trying to make money, sometimes both. Um, what we really need is this engineering discipline where we start to think about what is the problem, how do we assemble all the pieces, 
How do we break out of our classical boundaries of you know, CS versus STAT versus E and all that? How do we see there's all kind of one problem here? And uh, how do we educate a new workforce to kind of solve problems in this way? Thank you very much. So before we go um, to the uh, Q&A session, let me just make two comments. Uh, one, uh, Michael mentioned that uh, he'll be giving a talk uh, tomorrow morning. That's for the Data Science uh, Foundation. Uh, I'm not the person organizing that, but if you're interested, just go to Google and type Data Science Foundation Workshop Purdue, and then you can find out the information. I believe it's free for undergraduate students, and then for grads, I think it's 10 bucks. Just tell your advisor to pay it. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so just it's do it. It's a market. That's right, that's the price. It's price marketing, price. okay. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is that I got a, a question from our colleagues, and, and I feel that I have the burden to ask you this question since we're in Indiana, and we are big basketball lovers, and um, what do you think about Larry Bird? About? Huh? Larry Bird. Don't know what that is. Oh. So, so, so Larry is a pretty big uh, uh, basketball player. Uh, during the oh, time Larry Bird. I, I'm uh, sorry. Never mind. Michael I don't know. Jordan. I was in, in, in yeah, I was in, uh, <laughs> I was in Boston uh, as, at MIT as a young professor. So I definitely know who Larry Bird was. How do you think so. about it? Uh, they're both great. <laughs> okay, so Q&A time. Uh, any questions from the floor? Yeah. So thank you very much for the, the fantastic presentation. I also agree that we are very far away from uh, actually smart computers and stuff. My question is more, uh, you know, to your criteria on, on what is that? It, what is it that is missing to achieve that? And like, w what is this missing link that can allow us to to achieve that of a machine that could learn or or be conscious? Thank yeah, you. great question. So um, I'm going to be kind of say I don't know, but um, um, so one way to try to answer it is that work on problems where it seems that you really need some new, some more abstraction. You need some more semantics. Semantics is, you know, the fact that I'm talking to you is a semantic relationship among us, right? It's um, uh, there are semantic networks out there. There's kind of logical expressions. There's uh, if you work in the area of natural language processing. You have lots of data and you try to make predictions like what word comes next and, and you do things that neural nets can do pretty well uh, or translate strings to strings. But going down into a semantic representation of understanding what's being said and then reasoning about that, they're not doing, okay, at really at all. But if you're serious about that field, you try to build in that kind of thing. You try to engineer, I'd say, a semantic network, what's called an ontology often in industry. So a lot of industries now may have an you know, ontology with 200,000 nodes in it. 200,000 nodes in a graph of, you know, this person is a friend of this person, this person is, you know, married to this person, so on and so forth, or, or product relationships. And you try to bring those together with the machine learning sort of stuff, and it's a big engineering thing. All right, and you can start to get systems that can answer some simple questions or have some very, very simple dialogues. Uh, I'd say in 10 years you'll have things that do pretty good question answering kind of stuff and even some very simple dialogues in narrow domains and then they'll kind of break as soon as you get into bigger collections of people and all that. And by the end of our lifetimes, maybe there'll be some like online, um, you know, find a flight to Paris and you can really interact with the computer and have a real dialogue about that. But it's gonna be very slow engineering progress, kind of like going to the moon. You know, that level of big engineering efforts are gonna be needed. Now somewhere along that, maybe some magic will happen that there'll be a deeper understanding of what kind of abstractions are we talking about here? Is it like logical forms or is there some other way to think about the representations? How come humans are so fluent at this? And um, so I, I think working on those problems are probably the best way to discover that. I don't think looking at the brain or the mind is, uh, sadly. I mean, it just, it's too complicated. Um, but I think trying to build those systems will probably help. I'm not so sure there will be magic, because uh, in this notion of being able to abstract and have intelligence, like right now we're communicating at a very high level that our computers will be left in the dust, right? They're, like, they're still the, kind of down at the pixel level or the edges, and we're up at this kind of, you know, very abstract level. Any word in any language is very, very rich. You think about the word not in English. Think about all the, what, what does not mean, right? Not today. Not tomorrow, not you, not this, not that. Not all, every one of those versions of not has a different subtle, subtle state of semantics. 
okay? Every one of them, and, and it depends on the context. The shamanics can shift. We all know all that. We don't even think about it, right? Uh, the computer has to learn all that, but not just from lurking at strings of data. It's got to learn the context in which that sentence was uttered so that you understand the semantics of that, okay? Somehow, you know, I don't know what the magic is to get there, okay? Uh, now, so what if we found that magic? Would it be, how great would it be? Well, I'm not so sure. It would probably be change lives a lot, of, but you know, it would be, we just have a new human there. It just happens to be artificial. That would be exciting to some. I'm not that, we have so many humans. Why do we need, an, <laughs> you know? Another one. Um, really, I want more of these services that make human life better. And I think human life's a bit messed up right now in some ways, and I want them to be better. So I'm emphasizing this markets because I do see more intelligence there of a different kind that's not about the human that allows us to build better things and better systems and better believable, trustable things. And so, um, anyway. Yes? Your uh, online markets example, one question or one concern about this is you talk about what the consumer wants. Yeah. What the, the restaurant, for example, wants. Yeah. But often the, uh, you know, what the, the market maker in this sense wants, these are like in the case of, of Uber or these examples, often they're kind of natural monopolies. These are things that work very, you know, the, the more you have a monopoly, the better it works. Your goal is to accomplish that monopoly. And so if I think, for example, of restaurant recommendations, my goal might be very well served by having everybody show up at a restaurant, not be able to get in, and they think, wow, this is a great recommendation engine. It sent me to the restaurant that everybody loves. I'd push back against that. I mean, I, there's... Certainly markets do not solve it, quote unquote. And in fact, you need regulated markets. And part of the whole story will be what regulations are appropriate for these markets. But in your example there, if people are showing up and not getting served, the utility is to, have to eat well. And if no one's eating well, that's, that's, that's broken. No one's gonna play in that market anymore. They're gonna move to another market where they can eat well. Right? And I don't think, it, you know, there are some natural monopolies, but there, you know, if you do microeconomics, you learn there's kind of reasons for them. It's not a typical market phenomenon to be a natural monopoly. Um, and you can kind of break them by doing things like, you know, loyalty programs. Why do we have so many airlines still? Why isn't there just one airline? Well, you know, I have my points on United. I'm not going to go fly Delta. <laughs> you know, it sounds stupid, but really, that's really important that there's a little loyalty between a producer and a consumer, and that leads to breaking apart monopolies. And so there's all... So I'm not a microeconomics person, but as usual in my academic life, I like that I'm ignorant about a whole field. That just feels that oh, their way of thinking is real. It doesn't solve all the problems. It has a whole bunch of other ones. That's cool. I like that. Um, and even in the ad world, which I was bashing a lot, I know when people started to do online ad markets, they just didn't use classical Vickrey auctions or whatever from market design. That didn't work. They had to develop some new ones. Same thing here. All right, but I'm going to push back against people that say, well, no, we know markets don't work. See all the unhappiness in the world because of markets. That's not what you're saying, but there will be people saying that. Uh, and no, the 3,000 years of human development from the, you know, the sticks, markets is the number one reason why it's happened. All right, the ability of people to come in and trade uh, and economic prosperity follows from that. So there's something very robust and very healthy about that, suitably regulated, and suitably transparent with trust mechanisms, it is a path out of our current state that I want us to exploit better. Okay, so have we have limited time. Can we take one more question? Thanks for your lecture, uh, Professor Jordan. And I have a question that uh, nowadays um, there's some new methods like curiosity skiing or driving based methods. What kind which of is uh, curiosity. Curiosity. Curiosity skiing and which is uh, relate to the decision making. So whether you think this field is can re uh, combine with the non-convex or convex optimization? Uh, uh, you're kind of down in a particular little algorithm there and I, I um, let me just say that um, there is a lot of uh, innovative thinking going on in kind of the neural network world where people are trying out stuff. A lot of it is reinventions of things, and a lot of it is people just are narrowed down to this one thing. So curiosity, well, what does that really mean? 
That's a kind of a metaphor. Well, for me, it probably means you have some uncertainty and you're going to sample in places where you're a little more uncertain and you're going to favor that. Well, as you may know, there's a whole area of optimal experimental design, there's a whole area of causal analysis, and then there's the bandit literature. Just what I was talking about a minute ago, I don't know which of the K-arms are the best. It's not supervised learning. Therefore, I pick, if, what if I pick each one of them 10 times and I see which one is the highest and then pick the highest? That's provably a dumb algorithm. All right, a better algorithm is to have error bars around each one of the means that I get, and I pick the one that has the highest error bar. Okay, because now if it's really high because it's good, that's, I'm going to pick it, but if it's really good because I'm uncertain, I'll pick it too. That's curiosity in a very clean mathematical way, and there's a lot of theory there. So I don't want to, you know, diminish people's, you know, cleverness to thinking of new terminology and stuff like that, but you haven't, by, you know, thinking of mechanisms like that in the world of neural nets, you haven't gone outside of the whole scope of the, the area that many people have been working on, and especially for the younger people in the room, don't just focus on neural nets. You know, again, I love them. It's been great progress. It's been fun to see. Uh, but there's this whole broader control theory, statistics, et cetera, optimization, that if you're a young person, you should be educating yourself in all that and then be creative on top of that. Thank you. Can I um, just follow up one question for you? Because there are a lot of students in this room. Yeah. And what, what would be your advice to the students if they want to do machine learning? Um, yeah, he's asking about what should I advise students. Well, so uh, one thing I didn't talk about today is that we have a data science program at, at Berkeley, and we have actually kind of a new d division and a college emerging, and it's been a struggle uh, with all the deans fighting it and everything, just to say, here you have a dean who's not trying to fight it. You're lucky. Um, but one of the things we've done bottom up without any deans helping us, whatever, is we'd helped, we designed a bunch of classes that for undergrads. And so the first class is called Data 8 at Berkeley. Um, I was on the team that designed it, and I'm now designing a follow-up class. And we're pretty proud of it. Uh, it is a class that you learn, it's a for freshmen, and you um, assume they know no math or arithmetic. Um, and you assume they know maybe no computer programming. All right, so you're gonna teach them Python, all right? So, but you're gonna teach just enough Python to do something interesting statistically. So, for example, I talked about A-B tests and permutation tests, where I got two columns of numbers, and if it's really the same, I can put them together, I can permute them, and I'm still in the same null distribution, I can get a p value, blah, blah, blah. I can describe that to you, you would understand it in about two minutes, with no math, no Greek symbols, no nothing, and you get the kind of the beauty of it, I think, and students do. Then you could say, how do you do that in Python? Well, I need a list of some kind. You could teach the, the, enough Python to do that, and then you could ask a really interesting uh, um, conceptual uh, computational question, which is, how do you do a random permutation? How do you do that? Right, I got n items in a list. I want to permute them and get a uniform random permutation. So I'll leave you with thinking about that. The naive thing you will think about is kind of swapping all pairs. That gives you a permutation, but it's cost of n squared. That's not good in the modern world. Is there a faster algorithm? I can tell you the answer is going to be yes, but we make students think about it, and about half of them kind of figure it out. Right? Then the cool thing is that they put it in Python and they program it themselves, and then we get some real world data. So a typical example we use is, uh, here's the ethnic composition of juries in Alameda County, here's the population ethnic uh, distribution in Alameda County. Those are two columns of numbers, are they the same or different? Of course they're a little bit different, but as a statistician, are they really different? And so students love that. They can use their tools to actually get a p-value for, are the juries biased in Alameda County? And I can tell you the juries are biased in Alameda County. They quantify that. And then they can go on to all kinds of other problems. All right, so hopefully that inspires you a little bit. So we're doing no math there, but you can see there's like symmetries, there's permutations, there's group theory somehow sitting behind the scenes, there's some probability theory. And so then slowly over the next three years, we introduce a little bit more math to support that. Um, so what is the math? Well, it's probability and it's statistics, it's some optimization. Um, it's sort of some, you know, algorithms in computer science and some data structures, but, you know, um, th that is kind of the modern stuff that's most useful to us. And then I think some econ. But you can kind of craft your own thing. But anyway, it's, our job as professors is actually interlace these things in a single class. You look at the classical way of teaching Python, they'll teach the same s syntax we do. When they get to an example, it won't be some statistics or A-B testing problem. It'll be, how do you do Fibonacci series? Well, Fibonacci series are fine. My 12-year-old loves them. But I don't use Fibonacci series in my life. I never will. But do I use A-B testing? Yeah, well, I mean, Jeff Bezos uses A-B testing all day long. Um, so we need to teach those kind of things. They're inferential. So people talk a lot about computational thinking, that that's taking over. Well, no. It's, it's 
big part of it, but there's a whole other part about inferential thinking of using uh, algorithms to decide what's behind the data, not just process the data, but what, where the data come from. That's inferential. Um, so you have to, if you're going to be in this field, r get those both styles of thinking. One you get mostly from classical statistics and one you get from computer science, but ideally good universities will actually blend them and they won't just put, lump it, you have to take all these classes plus all these classes. It'll be, each class has a bit of a blend. Thanks for asking, yeah, it's great.